Timothy chapter number 2. Look at with me uh, in verse, we'll begin reading in verse 1 of 1 Timothy chapter number 2. The Word of God says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for the day that we have to come together today and to worship you and to learn more about you from your word and to gather among the saints of like mind. We're thankful for this source of truth that we have in a book that's been preserved for us to to, to know you and to know truth and to know what we must do in order to be saved. We're thankful for your son who's provided that for all of us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. What we're going to talk about, we've, we t- we've been talking about uh, unborn children and the need of, of, of well, the, the murdering of, of innocent children in the womb. Uh, God's standard on that topic and uh, the need to save the innocent. What I want to do this morning is I want to flip the script. I want to flip the script and I want to talk about the need to save the guilty. Not the need to save the innocent, but the need to save the guilty. The need for all mankind, regardless of race, uh, wealth, uh, you know, social status, uh, country of, of residence, or even your self-righteousness to be saved. First Timothy chapter number two tells us that it is the will of God for all men to be saved, not that all men will be saved. And so there's a, there's a need for mankind. We, if we talk about the need to be saved, there is, uh, first of all, the issue here, the need to, to, for, to be saved, who does it extend to? The need extends to all men, all men to be saved. And if the need extends to all men, and if the need is that we must be saved, what does that require? If you need to be saved, what, must, what do you need? You need a Savior. You need a Savior. And so, when we come to the Scripture, it doesn't, if, if you need to be saved, you know, you, you guys grew up in the comic book era, right? Where there are superheroes. When you need to be saved, you don't need a superhero. You don't need someone with superhuman strength that's able to, you know, leap tall buildings in a single bound, or someone who has spider-like reflexes to save you from the, from the villain. What you require is someone who is just, perfectly upright in all of their ways, and without sin. But when you think about what you require in a Savior, not only do you need someone who is just, and who is perfectly upright, and without sin, but that person also requires one other characteristic. Do you know what that is? It's required of that person that they would share their perfectness with you. So not only do you have to find someone who is right, but you also have to find someone who is loving, who would care enough about you, who would love you enough to take your place and die for you while simultaneously substituting their righteousness for your wickedness. You need something that's so much more than a superhero. You need a Savior. Uh, Turn your, your Bibles to Ephesians chapter number 1. And, uh, you know, as I was writing my notes, I started to write that, uh, that you're in luck. And then I thought about it, and I said, <laughs> the first thing that came to my mind is I had an aversion to that word luck. Because it has nothing to do with luck. Ephesians chapter number 1, we find out that God purposed the Savior that he made a plan to have it happen. He purposely did this. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 7. 
in whom we have redemption through His blood. That's your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace, wherein He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Having made known unto us the mystery of His will. So He's made known something to us. What is it that he's made known? According to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. That which he has made known is something that he has purposed to happen. It wasn't by coincidence that the Savior came into this world. It wasn't by coincidence that the Word became flesh like he just ran into Mary and boom, the Immaculate Conception happened. He purposed to come into the world. And he purposed to die for your sins. Verse number 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even in him. God had a purpose to gather all things into himself. And in order to make that happen, he knew you couldn't do it. Right? He didn't say, hey, mankind, I've created you. You owe me. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to be perfect. He knew that we couldn't. And so our redemption was purposed in God before we ever sinned. He loved us enough to provide a provision for us before our need even arose. Before you even existed. And He had us in mind through it all. What love. Now, I'd like you to turn to Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43 because you're in need if, uh, if there's a need to be saved, and all men need to be saved, and it requires a Savior, what you find throughout your Scripture is a description of God that calls Him the Savior. My point in, in, in saying this to you is that I hope that it sticks in your mind when you see Christ described as Savior in your Bible, you realize how intentional that is. I, I, I know how we all, we read the Scripture, we see Savior, we understand that He's our Savior, but you understand that all men have a need to be saved, and therefore He has provided Himself as the Savior. It is one of the terms that He is known by. Isaiah 43, look at verse number 3. It says, For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. Look down at verse number 11. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. So I want to do a bit, we've, we've been doing a heavy topic for a while. And this morning I wanted to do, back up and do more of a, an overview of the Bible. You know, and kind of a rightly dividing the word of truth overview. And when you read this, you see that, that the Lord Jesus Christ, He is the Holy One of Israel. He's thy Savior. He is the Savior that was promised to Israel. And then you see that it says here that I, even I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. He was sent to be Israel's Savior, and He is the only Savior. There is no substitutes. There is no imitations. There is no cheap knockoffs. There is the one and only, he says, I am the only. And when he says, I'm the only Savior, what is it that he's talking about saving them from? You know, this is not some ordinary saving, some normal saving that men could do, right? We're not talking about someone drowning and a man saving them. Right? We have lifeguards, we have men that can do that. But God says that I am the only Savior. We're talking about something that only God can do. You know, we have people who can bring men back from the brink of death. You know, there's doctors. And men can be dying, and men can bring their physical bodies back from the brink of death. God's not talking about bringing your physical body Back. When he says, I am the Savior, he's talking about something that is different. 
He's not talking about the breakdowns of your natural bodies. He's talking about a saving for which he is the only one that can do it. Turn over to Luke chapter number 2. As Isaiah says in prophecy, the, the Holy One of Israel was to be Israel's Savior. There's a dispensational aspect of him being Israel's Savior. Luke chapter number 2. Luke 2. And no, Luke doesn't come after Mark. I don't know what I was thinking. Or Luke doesn't come after Matthew, I meant. Luke chapter number 2. When, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes, when God himself be, becomes flesh and enters into the world, I want you to notice what he's described as. In Luke chapter number 2 and verse number 11, he says, uh, the word of God says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David, what? A Savior, which is Christ the Lord. There was a reason why God became flesh and entered into his creation. And the reason that he entered into his creation was to be born and to be a savior. Because man has a need. But in order to be a savior, he first had to suffer and die. And only by those means could he become a savior. You know, people celebrate Christmas, the birth of the Savior, and regardless of the calendar and the timing aspects, you know there's something that's far greater than the birth of Christ. I'm not, I'm not devaluing the fact that God entered into the world. That's an amazing thought. That God would enter into this world and be born. But the birth was only a means to the end. The, 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 the greatest testimony in, in, in Scripture is not that Christ came into the world. The greatest testimony in Scripture is that He became your Savior and that God came into the world and died for your sins. That is the greatest testimony. And so that's why I say that the birth was a means to the end, and that end was Calvary, which accomplished the purpose for which he came to be a savior. But in the prophetic program, look over at uh, verse number 25. I want you to see that when he was announced, to which city did he come? Did he come to New York or London? And we, we know that you know, New York wasn't really there or populated to the extent. Did he come to, but did he come to New York or London or, or Shanghai or, or Dubai? Where did he come to? It said in verse number 11, for unto you, who is the you there? Who's, that's talking to, to Israel. For unto you, Israel, is born this day in the city of David. There's Israel's king, a savior, which is Christ the Lord. But uh, in the, so in the prophetic program, who was, to be, who was he a, a savior to be? When I say for unto you, and I say that that's Israel, I'd like you to look at verse 25 of Luke chapter 2, where it says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he hath seen the Lord's Christ. So he was a just and devout man, and what, what was he waiting for? The consolation of Israel. Israel's consolation. Israel's Savior. Look at verse number 29. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace. <laughs> oh, what, a, what, a beautiful, what a beautiful testimony in Scripture that God gave to this man. And he sees it and he says, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace. I can now die in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. A light to lighten the Gentiles. Yes, but what? And the glory of thy people Israel. Israel. 
And Joseph, his mother, marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against. When the Lord Jesus Christ came in his earthly ministry, John the Baptist came preparing the way for him, and when he came, he came not to the whole world, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The Lord Jesus Christ came because to be a savior, he first had to get his own house in order. The plan of prophecy in Scripture was that the Lord Jesus Christ would be the Savior unto Israel, and then through the blessings that went to Israel, those blessings would burst at the seam and go out to the rest of the nations of the world. And so it's true that in the Gospels that He would be the Savior of the world, as you read over in John, but how would He be the Savior of the world? Not through the gospel of the grace of God that was committed unto the Apostle Paul, but that he would be the savior of the world through the prophetic program, through Israel first, that he would get Israel saved. They become a kingdom of priests, that they would rule from Jerusalem, and they would go out to the whole world. That's why, you know, you have the, the apostles who said that they would sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Where were those thrones going to be? They're going to be in Israel, and those 12 thrones would go out. They would judge the 12 tribes of Israel who were then going out to the nations, and all the nations of the world would come unto Jerusalem. Peter preached Christ as Savior. Look over to Acts chapter number 5. Acts chapter number 5. So we have Christ as Christ as Savior to Israel in the prophetic program. And when you come over to uh, Acts chapter number 5, you have Peter who's preaching. And he preaches Christ as Savior, but I want you to notice the manner in which he preaches. Look at verse number 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. There's the cross as good news, right? <laughs> Not really. There's some condemnation for you. The man whom you put on a tree was your Savior. You killed him. Verse number 31, Him hath God exalted with His right hand to be a prince and a Savior for to give repentance to who? Israel and forgiveness of sins. So he, Peter is preaching Christ, but he's saying that God has exalted him at his right hand as Christ has, has gone up to be with the Father. He says he's been exalted because this is Peter preaching after Christ has been resurrected, after the 40 days preaching of the, the apostles, of things pertaining, the disciples, things pertaining to the kingdom. And now you have the early Acts ministry where Peter is going out and he's preaching that Christ is who he said he was, and he says, now he's a prince and a savior for to give repentance to the whole world and that all men can be saved on the basis of what he did on the cross. That's not what you find in, in Acts when Peter is preaching. Peter says that Christ had come to be a prince, that's related to Israel, and a savior for to give repentance to Israel. Because first, Israel had to get right in order for the whole world to get right. And so for Peter and, and, and Israel, look at, I'm going to read a couple of verses from 2 Chronicle. 2 Chronicles chapter number 6. You're welcome to turn there if you want. 2 Chronicles chapter number 6. Was it, when we, when we rightly divide the word of truth and we understand that Paul is sent with a message on how we could be forgiven from our sins, is it a mystery that people would have forgiveness of sins? Uh, uh, Pastor Tom read in this morning, uh, this morning in the book of Isaiah about how, how Israel would, would uh, be saved from their iniquity, how that their iniquity would not be held against them. When it, when it told of the one who would come in Isaiah 53, look at 2 Chronicles chapter number 6 and verse number 25. It says, Then hear thou from the heavens, and forgive the sin of thy people Israel, and bring them again unto the land which thou gavest them and to their fathers. Lord, you've given us a promise. Please fulfill your promise. Please put us into the land. Give us the kingdom. And 
forgive the sins of thy people. When are the, the, the sins of Israel going to be forgiven? Well, well, we'll answer that question in a minute, but look at verse number 27. It says, Then hear thou from heaven, and forgive the sin of thy servants and of thy people Israel. So the, the issue here for, for Israel and getting a Savior, and when he comes and he says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, Israel knows that they need to be saved, but the Savior that they're expecting is the one who's going to come and who's going to give them the new covenant and institute the kingdom. This is what Israel is thinking. Your concept of having a Savior today is different than Israel's concept. So just because Peter preached Christ as Savior does not mean that Peter and Paul preached the same gospel. That is lazy Bible study. That is, that is lazy. I want you to notice some of the characteristics of what Paul says there in Acts 5, because I know you held your place there, right? If you were diligent enough to turn to 2 Chronicles, you had, held your place in Acts 5. It says uh, in Acts 5 and verse number 31 that he was, uh, him hath God exalted with his right hand and to be a prince and a savior, Acts 5, 31. When it talks about him being a prince, when it talks about Israel's savior being a prince, in order to have a prince, what do you have to have first? Can I just make up and say that Jim is the prince of, you know, the prince here? Well, what is he the prince of? You, you see, in order to have a prince, you first have to have a governmental authority. Israel had a governmental authority. They were promised uh, land, and they were promised a seed, and they were promised a throne. And if you have a throne, and you have a kingdom in which that throne is going to be put, you can then have a prince, and you can have a king. And so um, he was to be the prince. And when you read back in Daniel chapter number 9, he's de described as their Messiah, Messiah the Prince, that would eventually reign. And when the, when the prince reigns, Tom actually mentioned that this morning, funny coincidence, when the prince reigns in the kingdom, what is he called once he starts reigning? He's the king. He's the king of kings and he's the Lord of lords, the book of Revelation tells you. When he comes back, he's not called, he's not going to be sitting, he is going to be the ruler. He's going to be the king. He came as a prince, he will rule as a king. Now, how was Israel, when it says, uh, Acts 5.31, Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, how is he going to be the Savior? For to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. How was it that Israel was to repent? And how was she going to receive the forgiveness of her sins? How was Israel going to be saved by her Savior? All men, there's a need for all men to be saved. Now when we talk about that in 1 Timothy, it's the context of the dispensation of grace where Israel no longer has a standing before God. They're all in unbelief and all men need to be saved. But even when we talk in time past, when God was working through Israel, Israel had a need to be saved. But how was God going to save Israel? I'm glad you asked the question because Acts chapter number 3 gives you the answer. So when Paul says in Acts chapter number 5 that he's going to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins, he already told you in Acts chapter number 3 what that looks like. In Acts chapter number 3 and look at verse number 19. I put myself on, on like five times as fast to make up for the, <laughs> for the five minutes. In Acts chapter number 3, look at verse number 19. It says... Repent ye therefore, so Peter is preaching, and what he's telling Israel is, he doesn't tell Israel to, that Christ has died for their sins, and to trust that he's died, he was buried, and he resurrected for their justification. That's not what he tells Israel. He says to Israel, repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So there's an issue here 
of a, of a timing of being saved. And for the nation of Israel, if we were to divide this between Israel and the body of Christ, now, BOC, that stands for body of Christ. I put that on a PowerPoint before one time, and my wife, after church service, says, what, what in the world is the Bach? <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> um, so the timing for Israel, when does Israel, her Savior, that describes Christ, that he is going to be the Savior to Israel, when is the timing that Israel is going to be Save. When we think of saved, we, we think of having our sins dealt with, right? You notice in Acts chapter number 3, it says that your sins may be blotted out. When? There's the timing aspect. When does it happen? When the times of refreshing shall come. Does that mean that after Christ went to the cross, they all went down to the river and took a dip in the river and got water baptized, and it was so refreshing that their sins were then dealt with? Was that the times of refreshing? You see, the times of refreshing is described to you in verse number 21 where it says that, the, well, it said in Lord Jesus Christ, verse 21, whom the heaven must receive. So he died, was buried, rose again, taught the disciples of things pertaining to the kingdom, and then he is gone up into heaven. And he's there, and it says that he's there until, when is he there until? The times of restitution of all things. Christ is there until he's going to come back, the second coming of Christ, and set up that kingdom for Israel. Now, was, was Peter, were the disciples, were they really ignorant men? You know, when, were, were, were they just slow of hearing? You know, did they have first century ADD when Christ was resurrected and he taught them for 40 days of things pertaining to the kingdom? And in Acts chapter number one, right before this little arrow goes up and you know, right, right here, right before he goes up, like, like a minute before he goes up and they ask him, Lord, will thou at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom unto Israel? Why were they looking for that kingdom? Was it just because it was going to be a great time? No, that's because that's when the Lord Jesus Christ was going to be a savior for Israel. He's going to sit on a throne. He's going to give them the new covenant and give them perfect righteousness. He's going to put their, his law in their hearts. They're not going to have to, to they're, they're going to have the knowledge of God and be empowered to live the law. Why? So just to be clear, I just want to be very clear in case I didn't explicitly say it. When is Israel's sins going to be blotted out? When Christ comes back. The restitution of all things. When the times of refreshing shall come. Why was it that Israel's sins were not taken care of as soon as Christ died on the cross? Why are they looking, why, why wasn't it taken care of here? Why, why are they looking forward? What's going on with the timing aspect? Why do they have to wait for his return? It's because Israel's hope is not our hope. What Israel was looking for is that which was spoken of by the mouth of all the prophets since the world began. And they were looking for their kingdom when righteousness would be ushered in and God would institute that new covenant with them, that he would change their hearts and that they would be able to live that law out perfectly and they would have that righteousness. Look over at Jeremiah 31. We might as well look at it and see it. Jeremiah chapter number 31. Lest you take my word for it. Jeremiah chapter 31. I, I want you to see the issue of their sin. Uh, that, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the need of a Savior, the issue of sin, and there's a difference between Israel's program and what's going on in the body of Christ during the dispensation of, of grace where Paul has been given a revelation. Jeremiah chapter number 31 and verse number 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, <clears throat> 
that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Now, first of all, let's just pause there for a moment. When God tells Israel he's going to make a new covenant with them, what is the old covenant? What is Israel's old covenant? Israel, he takes Israel as a nation out of the land of Egypt. They're wandering in the wilderness. And what is it that's given to Israel in the wilderness? The law. We've got some, the law that's written on the, on the tablets. And God tells Israel to keep this. Israel says, we'll keep it. It will be our righteousness. <laughs> Israel's keeping it. They're in covenant relationship with God. That's why, you know, the, the way this chart is laid out, why is it that Moses is the first thing that comes once you have this line up here? That's because it is the covenant that God made with Abraham where he gave him a promise and then we get the law of Moses that's given here and now there is a difference between Israel and the Gentiles of the world. Everybody else who's not a Jew, there's a difference that comes with the covenant. Now is that old covenant, is that great and is it wonderful? The law is holy, it's righteous, it's good, but it's no, it's no pleasure to live under. And so what God tells to Israel is, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Jacob. Verse 32. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law on their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. Now that's wonderful, right? God says, I'm going to write my law on their hearts. They're going to be able to keep it. They're not going to need to, to, to know anything else because they're going to know me. But notice how verse 34 ends. He says, For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. You know that's not the case for Israel it's not the case for Israel here. It's not the case for Israel here. It's not the case for Israel here or here or here, even when Peter is preaching. How do you know that? I mean, he just told you in the prior verses in Jeremiah 31 there, he says, you've transgressed my law. You've broke it. He's remembering their iniquity, and he's telling them, I remember your iniquity. But there is coming a day when I will give you a new covenant and I will write my law on your hearts, I will forgive your iniquity and I will remember it no more. There's some eternal security there when the new covenant is implemented. Who is the new covenant made with? Israel. You are not Israel. Churchianity at large, they read the Old Testament and they see the wonderful pro promises of the kingdom, right? And they don't understand how, they look at that and they think, well, this is just, not, what's going on today in the dispensation of grace is just nothing more than what's been promised from the beginning and that we get the new covenant and that we are living in the new covenant. But my friend, that is what we have today in the dispensation of grace where you're saved by grace through faith and the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is not the new covenant. That doesn't match with what the Bible says. You want to believe it, you go believe it. But it's not what the Bible says. What does Paul preach about the timing of your salvation? Go to Ephesians chapter number 2. By the way, their forgiveness of sins that's going to happen when he institutes the new covenant, when we talk about that timing aspect for Israel, that is still yet future, right? Right? The new covenant has not been enacted. The kingdom's not on, down here on the earth. I can't, I can't fathom the, the, the post-millennialists who, who say, who, the, the all-millennialists who say that we're living in the kingdom now, I cannot fathom how they try to rec reconcile the scripture to the world today. Because the scripture gives a very specific definition a very, very specific adjectives of what the kingdom is going to be like, and it is not what's going on on the earth today. The, the kingdom is going to be a wonderful place. It's going to have the king of kings 
sitting from a throne, reigning from Jerusalem, reigning with the rod of iron. Righteousness will be implemented upon the, the millennium when, this, when, when Christ reigns. You're not going to have to deal with homosexuality. You're not going to have to deal with abortion. The very fact that we preach that for the last four weeks shows we're not in the kingdom. But that's not my point. Look at Ephesians chapter number 2. What does Paul preach about our timing in the dispensation of grace? Ephesians chapter number 2. Because you remember what Peter said in Acts that, he, that your sins will be forgiven, your iniquities will be forgiven when the times of refreshing comes from the Lord, right? When. He says, I'm not offering, it's not a present possession, you don't have it right now, but you need to repent so that your sins may, may be blotted out when the times of refreshing comes from the Lord. Notice what Paul says, Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse number 1. Paul says, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. In the body of Christ, you find timing words about how your sin has been dealt with. And one of the main timing words that you'll see is hath. And I pointed out, I tell you guys, I am not an English major. I, I always say I'm from Kentucky, and so English is not our strong suit, right? But when you get to the word hath, it is very clear. I know, I know what is present tense, past tense, and future tense, and I know that that word hath is a past tense word. I know that that means that when he quickened me, when he saved me, it was in the past. He did it when I was dead in my trespasses and sins, but now I've been quickened. Yet now hath he, and you hath he quickened. You see, you were dead in your trespasses and sins, but you are no longer in your trespasses and sins. And the iniquity of Israel, they're waiting for it to be, that, that it's going to be blotted out, that their iniquity will be dealt with when the Savior comes back. You've been given all life already. By the way, if God has given you life, what does that mean about your sins? Does God give life to anyone who is still in their sins? I heard it. That's the right answer. No. He doesn't give eternal life to those who have sinned. You know when Adam and Eve partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and they sinned against God? What is the first thing that God says? <laughs> I love the way that Genesis reads because it's like the Godhead. They're, they're looking there and they're like, well, you know, he's become like one of us. He knows good and evil. Well, we better remove that. We better remove them out of the garden lest they eat of the tree. The very first thing that, that God is talking about there after he deals with Adam and Eve and after he judges them is he says, we're going to remove them from the garden lest they eat of the tree of life and live forever. They've got sin. You don't want a sinner having life and living forever. You know how miserable eternal life would be if our eternal life was relegated to our sinful existence that we have on the earth today. Isn't it wonderful that our hope of heaven, that our eternal life that we have is, in with, is with a different hope of Christ's perfect righteousness where everything is in Christ and everything is exuding Christ and we love one another perfectly and that we have perfect righteousness. My point being is that if you have life, your sin is not imputed to you any longer. You are not in your trespasses and sins. If you've been given life, your sins have been taken care of. They've been dealt with. You have life as a present possession. Israel never experienced that. She will only experience that when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. When the church, the body of Christ... Now I'm going to mess things up here. Things have worked out really good so far. So I know I take, I'm taking a chance. Israel will only experience what you and I have today in the body of Christ. And the comfort that we have. And the assurity that we have, they will only experience that after the dispensation of grace is over and the fullness of the Gentiles has come in and we're called up to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. And the Lord Jesus Christ comes back and starts dealing with Israel. You've got the seven years of tribulation. Come to Sunday school next week and learn about that seven year period. And when, when that's dealt with, Israel's iniquity will be dealt with. Look at Ephesians chapter number two and verse number five. He says... Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, 
and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I wanted to point out two things there for, to you from that passage. Number one, the quickening is past tense. Number two, the life is present tense. Isn't that wonderful? You've been quickened in the past, and you have life now. Isn't that wonderful? We don't have Peter's message where... <laughs> Peter comes in Acts, and people think that the church, the body of Christ, began in Acts chapter number two. And Peter is telling those people that you only your sins will get blotted out and they're dealt with when Christ comes back. Is it any wonder today, denominational confusion, where you have people who think that their sins have not been dealt with, that they don't have eternal security, that they don't have life imputed to their account, that they might trip up in their sins, that they have to keep short accounts with God, that they have to repent and get right, that they have to go to the altar and take the whiteboard and clear it off so that my sins have been dealt with yet again until tomorrow happens, or till I leave the church building and someone cuts me off and I get mad again and let's put another sin on the board. We're not what Peter is describing to us. The timing aspect for Peter does not apply to us. You have a wonderful hope. You have a wonderful blessing. Your program is better. And God tells you your program is better because I want to make Israel jealous. That's what he tells you them in Romans. He says, I want to provoke them to jealousy. I want them to see what they missed out on. I want them to want to be my people. Look at Ephesians chapter number 4. Ephesians chapter number 4. And uh, verse number 32. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Where did your forgiveness happen? Past, present, or future? Past. You've been forgiven. I'm assuming I'm talking to a crowd of saved people. If you're not saved, you need to come to the realization that everyone needs to be saved. Look at Colossians chapter number 2. Colossians chapter number 2. <clears throat> Verse number 11. Colossians 2.11. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you, being dead in your sins and the, uh, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against you, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross." Peter says that your sins may be blotted out. What does Paul say? That he took, that he, he blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against you. God blotted that out. You don't have anything against you because you're, no longer, you're not under the law. You're under grace. You've trusted what Christ has done for you on the cross. You've trusted the gospel of grace. That your sins, everything that stood against you in the age of grace... That was blotted out at the cross. Past. It's already taken care of. By the way, if you're circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, what does that tell you about your identity and your reality? The sins of the flesh are dealt with, right? You're separated from that. You've been given spiritual life and alive unto God. And it's all because, look at Colossians chapter number 1. It's all because of the mystery of the revelation that was committed unto the Apostle Paul. He says in verse number 26 of Colossians chapter number 1, well, let's, let's start in verse 25. Where, whereof I am made a minister, according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you. Paul was given a dispensation of information. He was given some new information. 
And Paul said, it was given to me for you. And now I'm dispensing it. And that this information that was given to me, he says, is to fulfill the word of God. Verse 26, even the mystery, which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. Look, we are not waiting for the second coming of Christ for our cleansing, for our blotting out of the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. When Christ comes for us and we go to meet him in the air, we're already in right standing. He's coming to take his own. And the whole reason we get to go up and meet him in the air is because our sins have been dealt with. And we're going to get to be with him forever because of that. What we learn through the mystery is that the first coming of Christ, which will be the basis for Israel's cleansing at his second coming, but that the first coming of Christ back here and what he did on the cross is what provide is is imputed to us today during the dispensation of grace no future waiting it's being poured out freely upon all who would believe today the need of a savior all men have a need of a savior and the wonderful thing about what paul talks about in in first timothy chapter number two where he says that it's the will of god for all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth is that today Unlike back in time past where the Gentiles were down here, they were without hope, they were strangers from the covenants and promises made unto Israel. Down here, they had no hope. When Paul says today in the dispensation of grace that it's the will of God for all men to be saved, God has provided the beans by which all men can be saved. And he's sending out the gospel of the grace of God, how that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again for our justification. And when you trust that, you become saved. The moment you believe, your sins are dealt with, no more iniquity, and the need of your Savior is dealt with. No future timing like Israel. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We're thankful for your Son and what he's done. We're thankful that we live in an age of grace where we have such a wonderful message and a wonderful hope to, to proclaim to a lost and dying world. Lord, help us to... Help others to see the need of a Savior. We're thankful that you are that Savior, that you took that responsibility upon yourself because no one else would have been able to do it. We're thankful for that cross and the blood that saves us from all of our sins and the present possession of life that we now have. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.